I, 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 you're very intelligent people, I can tell. Most of the uh, poor souls are out there in the cold waiting to get into the tents for two hours, and they move about this fast, you know. Terrible. Have you been out there? Yeah. It's endless. The line is endless. And they're still selling tickets downstairs. Oh. Uh, well, here we are again. <laughs> uh, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Mr. Joke's here. And, oh, Mr. Skirchuk's on his back on the floor. Yeah. Good. Well, I don't know what to say. Have you any questions right off the bat? I'll take feeling, care of that. <laughs> uh, I brought some things here to, uh, to uh, I think I will. If I found my glasses, I can do it. Otherwise, it's all off. Yes, yeah, sure. Right <laughs> These glasses are, uh, they got to be, what's this, this is the 2004, they're probably 130 years old. I found them in an old uh, cousin's, uh, and, they, and they work, that's scary, they're for reading, you know. But they're so skinny, and the lenses are totally flat, I don't know how they do that. But they magnify, and the lenses are flat. I have no answer to how it's done, it was like curved. The more curved, the worse your heart, the worse your uh, hearing or your sight is. Hearing and sight, I'm screwed up already. Uh, so I'm going to. Uh, it probably belong to Gasport. Say it again. It probably belong to Gasport. Gasport. <laughs> oh, there you are. <laughs> We've got all kinds of things here, uh, some of which you heard before, but. Uh, I was going to read you something. Oh, here's the song. Remember, remember too. You got that here, do you? Uh, uh, that's it. The poem, not the song. Yes, the poem. Right. But I've got the song here, so it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, that's what. But uh, uh, a big fan of mine uh, is. Uh, he made a mistake one time of having an argument for a policeman who's stopping for a traffic ticket or something, and the things got on. He, he hit him. You know, fist fight with the police. Mm. Apparently, knocked him down. So they took him to court, and uh, the, the, the sentence—I forget what the sentence was—but his brother, he said he was so upset. His mother had died after a long, serious illness, and he was so upset that that day that he swung on the guy uh, for what this minor infraction was. And he ended up. His brother thought it'd be good if he was. Uh, told the judge to send my brother to the veterans hospital because he'd come out of Vietnam. And he thought that uh, if he did that, that he might not uh, have to stay behind bars or whatever they want. The, the police wanted to put him in behind bars. And he was sentenced to five years. But his brother thought that if he went to the veterans hospital, they would uh, realize he wasn't that terrible a violent man. And he was upset when it happened and all that. And he would only be in there a little while. But instead of that, he ended up at a New Jersey State psychiatric kind of a place. And uh, he's having to do five years for swinging at a cup. Uh, which you know, I have no idea. I wasn't there when it happened, whatever. But I mean, there was no gunfire in that guy. It was just a, <coughs> excuse me, a physical struggle. And, uh, but he, he's, he, he writes these great things. Uh, and he, he runs a. Uh, what do they call this place? Uh, the uh, what's the name for it? He calls it a loony bin here. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so he's in a kind of a psychiatric complex of some kind where they have cottages and all that stuff. And uh, but he writes, and he wrote this wrote this thing about uh, George Harrison. He was a great for the Beatles. He loves music, and uh, he wrote this about George Harrison, and he put it in the uh, hospital uh, newspaper. And he says, I was just voted president of the patient's government. Uh, so here it is here. This is what he said. I heard the news today. Beetle George has passed away. The Fab Four are now two. The world is better cause of you. When you see John on the other side, tell him, imagine, hasn't arrived. Something is the song you wrote, my sweet Lord gave us hope. You're at peace now, you rest, while broken hearts beat at our chests. Paul and Ringo, so sad today, Brother George has passed away. Help, it's been a hard day's night. 
Sorry to hear you lost the fight. All guitars gently weep. Golden slumbers eternal sleep. I never got to say hello, goodbye is stuck in my throat. Sit and cry filled with sorrow. I hear yesterday, forget tomorrow. <coughs> A piece of us has died today. All things must pass, you'd say. Goodbye from us left behind. See you in another time. Though the news is rather sad, the Beatles are the best we ever had. That's the end. Goodbye, my friend. We love you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take care. That's pretty nice. Yeah. And, uh, he's, <coughs> he's going to have to spend the, the whole five years in that institution. Well, having said that, I mean, that, that uh, shakes me up when he sends me things like that. And I realize there's really nothing wrong with him at all. Uh, his brother's desperately trying to get him out. Every time he comes up for a, a parole, or whatever you call it, <coughs> to leave the hospital, uh, something happens. And he says he gets angry once in a while when the, the authorities uh, get very strict or something. And he argues with them, and right away they say, you're not fit to get out of here. So that's life. What should we do here? Is there any... any um, any more questions? <laughs> you had none before. <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I, I don't know what they're going to do with this convention. There's too many people. Have any of you been out there waiting for two hours to get in? To buy a wristband? Then you go outside and there's a line outside you wouldn't believe in the parking lot waiting to get into the tents. And they, they put up an extra tent this year to make it easier. And it's, uh, it's worse than ever. I don't know what would have happened if we had a sunshine day today. It would be more, more people than we have. But it's, I, I don't know what the answer is. They've got to do something. Because they can't expect you to come here and stand in line all day long. It started because the fire department said the place was getting too crowded. And a couple of years ago, it really was. You just couldn't budge on the hallways here. And they had to stop that. But the result is, is the hotel is not big enough. I don't know what to do. Maybe they should rent giant stadium and put a tent over the whole thing and, <laughs> and everybody could come. Amazing. I was I went to Scott Muni's funeral at St. Patrick's. And is there a microphone here I should be using? There's can no microphones this Can time. you hear? Okay. That's good. <laughs> I guess. Anyway, I went to Scott Muni's funeral, which was at St. Patrick's. And uh, boy, they really used the expression, set him off in great style, you know. Had a bagpiper and a lot of policemen and all that stuff. And everybody in the radio and TV show business was there. Very impressive. And uh, why am I telling you this? Oh, so on the way out, I was walking out at Pat St. John, and I said, boy, this is some send-off. I said, what are they going to do when Cousin Brucey dies? <laughs> <laughs> they'll, have to, they'll have to put it in the Grand Central Station or something. Yeah. Anyway, he was, he was a great old guy, and uh, of course, Brucey, I don't think Bruce is going to die. <laughs> he just goes on. He's the same every day. I mean, he's, he gets a more expensive hair piece every once in a while. He's Brucey. He's not going to. He talks that way all the time. Like he's right here, right now. Ah, oh, it's Brucey. How are you? We all know Energy all over the place. <laughs> amazing, amazing guy. And what else do you want to talk about here? Uh, hmm. Cameras. I have never seen so many cameras in my life. All this digital stuff. If you've got a film camera, you're an antique. I mean, you're 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 a rare person. Uh, you've got one right. He's got, a, he's got right. one here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You take down the one-hour place and wait five hours for the film. No, I, I could bring it in and I could pick it up yeah, next day. No, no, no. <laughs> but these digital cameras are astonishing. You know, click, look at it, look at this. Here it is. Do it again. Whoop. And it's instant. You know, it's just amazing. And most of the film cameras are just being put away in the closet, and everybody's gone digital. And it's great, it's great. Is that digital? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. That's yours also? Yeah. Oh, it's the one on the tripod. Is that a... That's just a video camera. Yeah. Oh, look normal to me. Normal cameras. <laughs> How about way back there? Is that film? Digital. Digital. Bingo. Well, well, well. Anyway, uh, we put out a DVD. I, I assume most of you got that archives thing that had uh, mm -hmm. kinescopes of the early shows. I just wish that uh, 
just lately, I don't know if it's the fact I'm getting really old now, that I think back of things I should have done. We had those kinescopes made by an engineer. Uh, when I first came to New York, it was all live, live television. You know, make a mistake, keep going. Uh, then they started doing tape shows, and we used to tape the show on a Thursday afternoon. The guy thought he was doing us a big favor. He says, well, Thursday afternoon you got from 4.30 to 6 o'clock to do an hour and a half show, whatever it is. That's two hours and a half. Well, figure it out. Can't stop. So they call that live on, on tape. Because you do everything you got to do, but you can't stop. You make a mistake, you cover it up, keep going. Uh, and so the guy who was working with me on the, on the TV shows each week, he knew that the engineer who would show that tape we'd make on Thursday, he'd show it on Saturday night, late at night. And uh, then on Monday, they would wipe the tape off and use the tape over again. <laughs> the tape, tape was this wide, you know, very wide stuff. Uh, and none of us thought that uh, in the terms of uh, uh, miniaturization, which we should have been aware of, it was going to happen eventually. You could buy a tape at a CBS and stick it in your machine, you know, a home, home video, all that stuff. And uh, so now what was I talking about? DVD uh, why was I off on this crazy tangent? Oh, oh okay. So, so uh, we we made these, put these things on the on the. All we had was intermissions from four shows: one from Philadelphia and three from New York. And I wish that I had uh, gone into debt to tell this engineer <coughs> to copy an entire show, not just the intermissions, at least one. You know, every week we did one, and if we could realize that that was a pretty funny show, that's the one we should have saved. What we got is okay, but there were some shows that everything worked, you know, the big sloppy amoeba and all that stuff. Uh, but we didn't do that. And I went to Channel 9 after that, and they, uh, they were smart. They bought used tapes. The original tapes cost $300 a reel, and every time they used a tape and, cut and, and erased it and used it over again, they would mark that on the box until it got up to the point where it had been used 50 times. They would sell it as a used tape. And Channel 9 would buy nothing but used tapes, <laughs> save money. But as a result, when they made the tape, they kept it. They kept the whole year that we did it, Channel 9, and they showed them again the next year. And I never woke up to the fact that I should have asked somebody, hey, can you make a videotape? Of they didn't have the best movies, but occasionally we had a, had a good one, like Mighty Joe Young or something like that. <laughs> and. Uh, I wish we had done that, but that didn't happen. And nowadays, with all this digital stuff, uh, nobody who's on the air has any reason to uh, not save everything. But the stations didn't have a historical division where they would keep things uh, from at least one show from everything they did. Uh, shows that were on the air for like one year, they didn't keep a copy of even one. Uh, they, they should have been keeping, uh, uh, you know, like a historical record. Uh, I remember going into a, uh, a room in WOR, I was looking for a sound effect, a lot of noise, a lot of cheering people. And he says, well, right in that room right there. I opened the door, here's great big transcriptions, which are big uh, recordings on, on the discs, uh, vinyl. And they had a room full of cutters, and if a radio broadcast was being broadcast that time, they could record it on this disc, just slow turning, you know, and it's cutting, cutting grooves, and they call them transcriptions. But it was like a big, great big giant, uh, about this big, I think, bigger than a 12 inch uh, record that we're used to have seen. And they threw them all away. Uh, I found the crowd noise, you know, they had speeches by Hitler and Churchill and all those things, and big crowds cheering, well, we used some of that. But uh, that was as far as they went, and I was in the Daily News building, uh, and the same thing happened there. They had great big, beautifully bound, hardcover books about this fat of the Daily News newspapers, every one they were printed. Huge wall full of them, and they started to throw them away. So I found one, I mean, I, heavy, man. So I hoisted one home one day that they had put out in the curb to get rid of. But nowadays, of course, they would microfilm the whole thing, which at least is saving. It doesn't take any space at all. 
but uh, that's what happened to everything, and that's the reason we didn't save thing in the old days. But had I had some brains, I would have uh, asked that engineer, you know, we just gave him a couple of bucks to do this, to make these little, he did most of the intermissions of the shows at w, Channel 7, and I never pursued it with Channel 9, and Channel 11 had the worst movies of all, <laughs> but it was fun. I, that's where I met Chuck McCann and all, Officer Joe and Captain Jack, oh boy, and Fireman Bill, all those people, Beachcomber Bill. Oh boy. I told you the story about Beachcomber Bill. Chuck McCann was very annoyed with him as a person. And uh, Beachcomber Bill had a parrot. <laughs> Remember that? He told yeah. Me. I may have told you the story. Yeah, it's a good story. Oh dear. Well, I'll tell him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, uh, Chuck McCann, who has a mischievous kind of a streak in him, he was so annoyed at this guy because he left the parrot in the office that they all shared over the weekend. And a bird on the loose can make a mess of a, you know, <laughs> physical mess and everything else, you know. So uh, he, he said he, he got a hold of the parrot and he taught the parrot to say, screw you. <laughs> no more violent word to use. <laughs> the, big word, the big F word. Uh, over and over again he said, <laughs> F you, F you, F you. <laughs> and he claims that uh, when it suddenly happened that uh, Beachcomber Bill had the oh, yeah. parrot on his show, <laughs> he let go with F you. <laughs> While they were on the air, you know. <laughs> uh, <well. laughs> but uh, Chuck had, uh, had the, the puppets, what was the guy's name? Uh, who was the puppeteer? Fred somebody. And, and I learned a lot from him. He was, he was a great guy. And he's out in California, and he's, he, did, he did very well. He used to do a lot of voices for the Hanna-Barbera cartoons. And he still does some of that stuff, except I think Hanna-Barbera is out of business now, I'm not sure. But he still gets called, and he makes some films, too. He does some nice work. But he's a great guy, and he's still full of fun. And all you got to do is remind him about uh, working at Channel 11, and he, he shakes his girth. <laughs> he's got a stomach, you know. He always did. And uh, he's, he's a great old guy. Anyway, uh, I don't know why I bring up all this stuff. Why am I telling you all this? Good. It's history. You already heard it. Yeah. Many times. Well, <laughs> I'm here every year. <laughs> Do we still have any questions here? Oh, something that we got good. Yes. Can you sing a song? Sing a song? <laughs> oh. I was on the radio yesterday on the, on the Q104. And I went into the studio the day before to, uh, <coughs> I could tell you this whole story, to, uh, to record some stuff, and then they take my voice and put the music in it and make a show. I knew what each, each song was going to be, so I made some reverence. And uh, they, they played it yesterday. So first, Scott Muni has a half, uh, had an hour at lunchtime every day when he played Beatle music because he had a Beatle connection here for years from England. <clears throat> now that he's dead, of course. So in his honor on Friday, which was yesterday, they uh, played a few Beatles songs, and then I took over and uh, gave them my memory of him. Uh, I had met him when I was on WNEW FM. And I was very lucky to get that kind of a job. I never dreamed of being on the radio, but that was a great place to be because we were able to pick our own music and all that great music was coming out in the mid-60s through the 70s. And uh, I'm forgetting what I'm trying to talk about here. Uh, what was your question? Can you sing a song? Sing a song. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this, they played some of these old songs from way back that I hadn't heard in years, like Tisket a Tasket and things like that. Uh, on this, And then they played it again last night at 11 o'clock, a whole much more of it. So at one point in, in our... Uh, recording in the studio talking to the disc jockey. Uh, we started kidding around and we got in one of those incredible laughing sessions where we just had to stop. And there's a guy in there with a camera for some reason taking this whole thing. I said, what are you going to do with it? He says, boy, where do you see it? It's terrific. But they didn't get any of that on the air. It wasn't particularly dirty. It wasn't bad. It was just hilarious laughing like you can get a crazy uh, laughter going in a family 
reunion or something. You know, amazing. But uh, that's how everything is done on radio now. People come into the studio and they record a lot of introductions and things like that about the music for a whole week. Then they take it and put the music in it and make a show. So the people who used to be on the air for the whole week are not really there. And all they get paid for is that one day where they sat for two hours and said, hello, this is it, and this is the next song, and so on. And I uh, hope you're enjoying the day, and whatever. Uh, and that's the way radio is done these days. An awful lot of people have <coughs> been uh, eased out. I was on satellite radio. That's exciting. That serious company that has units in your cars, you know, brand new car. They, uh, they play all this stuff, and I, I've never been bounced around in the space like that. <laughs> so let's sing a song here do, uh, before I forget what I'm talking about. Come with me to Thank you. Oh. It's a poem. It's a poem? Yeah, the one for internment for two, the dedication. Oh, this is the beginning? Just the, the poem. Yeah, in the beginning. Right. Yeah, or oh, the intro. This, uh, he, he's, he's the guy that makes these CDs, which uh, last one was called, uh, what was it called? Uh, internment for two. No, the first one. Dedication. Oh, Dead Man's Ball? Dead Man's Ball. Right. The next one's going to be in call, in called Internment for Two, and this is the introduction. I didn't know there'd be a quiz. Am I right about this? Yeah, there's no music to it. It's a poem. I know. It's okay. a poem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll get around to the music. This is the introduction. And this is the dedication right in the first verse. My dear, as you lie napping, and I stroke your matted hair, I feel compelled to prove to you how much I really care. I may not say I love you very often to your face, but deep inside you know that you're my favorite basket case. We share a certain chemistry and get along so well, it makes me want to stay with you regardless of the smell. They say you love to take it. Wait a minute. They say the love you take is equal to the love you make. But nothing says I love you like a hammer and a stake. <laughs> I'd climb the highest mountain or swim the deepest ocean if I thought that it would prove my true undead devotion. I'd gladly bring you fresh bouquets of flowers every day, but cemetery workers keep on chasing me away. Now at last I've found a way to prove my love still strong. I'll throw my heart and soul into the lyrics of a song. And every tune that follows, I know dedicate to you. So join me as we share our internment for two. And we're going to do what song? Come with me to Transylvania. Right here, right? All right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to have my union card. Oh, come with me 
Oh, sure. <laughs> this comes from the, the uh, DVD we did this on. Excuse me, the CD. Wait a Video. <laughs> I don't want to play in your yard. I don't like you anymore. You'll be sorry when you see me sliding down the cellar door. You can hover down my rain barrel. You can climb my apple tree. an old Odinum song that I remember when I was a kid. It was a, it was a crazy little, I don't know who, who did it, but it goes way back into the 20s, I think. Not sure. The 20s. I remember the 20s. I hate to admit that. I sort of remember anyway. Uh, yes, that was on, it's in there. It's on that uh, Italian uh, opera that I sang on the, uh, on the video. Uh, we did that, we did that. Uh, well, how about this one? this one? Uh, I've got him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now this is the story of Doc Frankenstein. He made a big monster. Then he wants a blue ribbon for his needle point. Dracula sleeps in his coffin all day. When night is descending, he goes out to play. He wears a tuxedo dress shirt underneath. Then he pulls out a nail file and sharpens his teeth. A young man named Larry went walking one night. A werewolf attacking, they had a great fight. Now Larry goes prowling with hair on his face, and he doesn't wear shoes, which is quite a disgrace. Old Caris was buried alive, so they say. For three thousand years in his wrappings he lay. He loved his son on bed, as cute as can be. Now they drink to each other in Tannerly tea. Remember Tannerly tea was supposed to cure all your ills? Questions? Yes? Uh, I wish you a happy birthday. You're wishing somebody a happy birthday? You. Oh, yes, I had one. I've already moved a month into the next one, which is a little scary. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. How many anyway. years were you on New York City TV? Say it again? How many years were you on 7, 9, and 11? Uh, oh. I, I, you, know, you came to New York in 59. Uh, and then the last half of 59, like in okay. September, and went through. So then I went from there to Channel 9. And as I say, that lasted two years because they replayed those things for a whole year. And then I went to Channel 11. So it was about uh, three or four years. Yeah. I don't, uh, I'm no, I was no uh, big businessman or whatever you want to call it. I think uh, Channel 9 did the smartest thing. Uh, they were taping the shows like I described, and uh, where Channel 7, when I first came here, they showed them late at night. And most of you people, well, it seems to me a majority of people, remember me from Channel 9 because they played the shows Friday night at 9 o'clock and Saturday at noon, I think, and Sunday about noon also, which is a great idea. They really should, I think, probably have zeroed in on Saturday afternoon, like a matinee time, you know. Uh, when I was a kid, I wasn't allowed to go see these movies, and that's when they were shown on Saturday afternoons for kids. Uh, and that's probably what we should have done. But Channel 9, uh, Channel 7, right, they're all excited <coughs> because they got a lot of people listening, at, even late at night. And uh, the, the, the ratings war, they did very well against uh, Jack Parr, or I guess that was who it was, was the big thing late at night, and we beat him, which which annoyed him. I was on his show one time. <laughs> I was on his show one time. And then I was standing over here waiting to go on, you know. In between the commercials, they say, next segment, next segment. And next thing you know, I'm, the show's almost over. When I say, okay, they say, go on. So I did my, it was funny, a funny little, I lost my monster. And he and uh, Cliff Arquette, what was his name? Charlie Weaver, 
were dressed up like detectives, and it was a takeoff on the uh, uh, dragnet. Dragnet. Uh, uh, dragnet, right? Yeah. Yeah. You said that. Yeah. I thought you. Did. <laughs> <laughs> and it was came out kind of funny. It was a little fat, fast dialogue back and forth, which we were reading. And after it was over, he said, he made a little speech after I went off the stage. A big applause. He says uh, he came out and he said. Uh, I know what this is. He says, this is a Zachary audience. He says, I can always tell when a guest comes here with their own audience. <laughs> and uh, I just want you to know that Zachary is in kind of a competition for us, you know. But uh, he saved it to the very end, hoping people had left the, gone to bed. <laughs> but he was, he was a nice guy, really. But he was, that's why I kept, he kept putting it off. He says, I can always tell this is Zachary's audience. And they all cheered, you know. <laughs> well, did he die? Yeah. yeah. He's dead. See, I'm still here. Yeah. Well. Well, I had a, I had a great operation. Uh, I bet not too long ago, two months ago. Yeah. It was. Where they they stick a catheter in here and it comes out here in your heart, and you can watch it on TV. <laughs> uh, I was ready for that, you know, because I think my next door neighbor had the same thing. And uh, but they they fooled me. They put me out cold, and it was all over. Oh. And they go up inside your heart, and they poke around in there, mm -hmm. and they find out why where the place is that's causing it to go bump, 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 bump instead of bump, bump, bump. And when they find that place, they turn on the juice and they burn that little part the inside of your heart. Mm -hmm. They call that a an ablate or something like that. And you wake up in the afternoon and you're in a room, you know, and you take a nap. I ended up in a private room because all the other rooms, all the other rooms were full. <laughs> and I'm sitting there by the window, great big window, looking at the East River and watching the uh, the Coast Guard patrol boats go up and down looking for terrorists, you know. I was waving at it like that. <laughs> I'm sitting there right, looking right out the window. And the uh, next morning I went home, all over. So if anybody has that problem, great. I had it when I was a kid and I, and I got over it, this jumping heart, and it came back to haunt me in my mid-70s. And now it's gone. But there are other things to worry about. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, well. Uh, any other questions? Somebody else? Yes. Before uh, TV and who are your major influences in your life? Can you translate that? <laughs> who are your major influences in your life? What was that? I didn't get the first one. What did you do before you were on TV? What did you do before you were on TV? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Practically true. I never uh, came out of the Army and uh, I never shot anybody. I was always behind the lines uh, in the World War II. And uh, I really didn't know what to do. I thought I was very impressed. All of us were very impressed by all this stuff that was coming over, new airplanes and boy, the manufacturing was going, it was astonishing. We supplied all the armies that were fighting Hitler and uh, it was just amazing. And uh, we were all impressed by these big companies like the Ford Motor Company was making, you know, 16 bombers a day and all that stuff, these big assembly lines, we've seen pictures of them. Uh, and uh, so I thought maybe a good idea to go to work for one of these uh, fantastic corporations. <coughs> but somehow it never happened. I never really thought about it after I got home. Uh, no, I started fooling around with a, uh, my cousin uh, induced me to, oh, hey, look at this. Uh, my cousin introduced me to uh, a local, uh, you, you, anybody need a little, <laughs> whoa, it's for the back row, ready? <laughs> oh, not very well done. Anyway, I started messing around with a little theater group in Philadelphia, and eventually one of the ladies who, uh, who worked there, who, you know, came in, and it was all amateur thing, but pretty neat. They had a little barn, an old uh, colonial barn in uh, Philadelphia, and that was their headquarters, and they built a stage and all that. And uh, she, uh, she told me one day, she said, why don't you go out to Channel 10? They're hiring people for uh, a cowboy show. So I did that. I had no intention of doing that in my, in my life. It just, uh, I, I went out there and they, uh, 
it was a live show with horses and you know guns. And we all got dressed up as cowboys, and for a week we were chasing somebody, and next week we chased somebody else. Mm -hmm. It was set on a little town, you know, and there was a sheriff and, a, and his wife and a newspaper man and a blacksmith. They were regular people. And then there was always a stranger who would come in and raise, raise hell, and then they'd have to get him out of town or hang him or marry him off to somebody, and then somebody else would come in next week. Like any kind of a, you know, soap opera. And, uh, that's how it happened. And one week, I, I played an undertaker. I've told you this. I played an undertaker. And two years later, they said, hey, we got these horror films. You want to be the host? Had a big black coat like this, you know. And so they thought I could be an undertaker. Uh, why not be a host? So I, I became a host of uh, horror movies. Uh, you looking for some mints? Um, no, sir. My <laughs> apologies, <laughs> sir. There's just there's another panel that needs to get on because they, they only have a little bit. Oh, more we got something going on coming up. Okay, okay. So, oh, that, that's cool. So, cool. If there's no other so questions, I'm gonna there's go someone else. Try and catch up with those people and wait for. Has to, to, has to get on. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Turn your clocks back.